They're the final names on the Vietnam Wall. The final casualties of U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia. On May 12, 1975, less than two weeks following the United States evacuation of Vietnam, the SS Mayaguez, a cargo ship, was steaming off the coast of Cambodia when it was fired upon, boarded, and seized by Cambodian communist forces, the Khmer Rouge. I felt that it was a violation of international law and that we as a government had an obligation to uh, get the crew and the ship back. Three days later, on May 15th, American forces were poised to launch a massive attack on a small island called Koh Tang. What they didn't know was that they were about to invade the wrong island. The battle for Koh Tang was part of an international incident known as the Mayaguez Crisis. The following story is told by the people who were there and contains never before seen secret footage and radio communications of the actual events. In the spring of 1975, the SS Mayaguez, a 500-foot merchant ship of U.S. registry, routinely sails the volatile, war-torn waters off the coast of Vietnam and Cambodia. On this particular trip, we uh, left from Hong Kong and uh, were headed to um, Sadahip, Thailand. I was on wheel watch steering the ship. Uh, I believe I just got re uh, relieved when uh, we received the fire. Uh, a shot across our bow. I felt the vibration of the ship stop, so I went outside to see what the problem was. On the bridge, Captain Charles Miller scribbles a hasty entry into the ship's log. May 12, 1975, 1420 hours, reduced to maneuvering speed. Vessel challenged by gunboat, and gunboat fire shots across starboard bow. 1421, engine stop. 1425, gunboat P128, comes alongside. When I got outside, I, I saw these uh, Cameroon soldiers coming aboard with black pajamas on, bandoliers, automatic weapons, rocket launchers, and I knew exactly what was happening. I was awakened on the morning of the 12th of May by Brent Scowcroft, who uh, said there were radio indications that an American merchant ship, the Mayaguez, had been seized in international waters. I called both the CIA and then I called Henry Kissinger and he had heard the same report. So we mobilized and by 10 o'clock that morning we had an NSC meeting. The White House quickly issues a statement that the failure to release the crew will have the most serious consequences. The reaction was we had to do something and had to do something dramatic. Having just evacuated Indochina, we could not graduate to the point where American ships could be captured on the high seas. During the meeting, Director of the CIA William Colby briefs the National Security Council. Colby informs the President that the Mayaguez is being forced into the Cambodian harbor of Kampong Som and will be making port within the hour. The imminence of these American hostages arriving in Cambodia was something that provided a greater urgency to our decisions. The President puts U.S. forces in the Western Pacific on alert and orders a naval task force led by the aircraft carrier Coral Sea to proceed immediately to the Gulf of Thailand. Ford also orders the Pentagon to conduct round-the-clock surveillance of Mayaguez. In this never-before-seen secret surveillance footage, the Mayaguez can be seen surrounded by Cambodian gunboats. She is located on the evening of May 12th not on the port of Kampong Song, where the CIA reported, but at anchor off a small island in the Gulf of Thailand called Koh Tang. Very little is known about Koh Tang. It is a three mile by two mile island covered with dense jungle, about 35 miles off the western coast of the Cambodian port of Kampong Song. The chance that the Americans had been taken off the ship and put on Koh Tang is encouraging. A rescue 
would be nearly impossible if the Mayaguez crew were taken to the Cambodian mainland. Everybody, especially President Ford, who was in the Congress at the time, remembered the Pueblo incident where the North Koreans captured an American ship and sort of humiliated the United States by not releasing the prisoners. But the fear in the White House goes well beyond the political implications of the Mayaguez. The thing to keep in mind about the Khmer Rouge is they're probably one of the three or four most brutal, genocidal regimes the world has ever seen. They ended up killing two million out of seven million in the country in about four years. To leave Americans in the hands of the Khmer Rouge was something we would not accept. On the diplomatic front, Ford is faced with a difficult situation. How to negotiate with a country the U.S. does not officially recognize? The Mayaguez crisis is becoming an exclamation point on one of the darkest chapters in U.S. foreign policy. April 12, 1975, the American embassy in Phnom Penh is evacuated. Five days later, the Khmer Rouge march into Phnom Penh and evacuate the city a million people taken out, marched out and into forced uh, new living arrangements in the countryside. Two weeks later, April 25th, Saigon, the American Embassy evacuation begins. We, the United States, had been literally kicked out of Saigon by the North Vietnamese. The void left in Southeast Asian diplomatic channels leaves Ford few options. The best avenue to get our message to the Cambodians was through their friend, their ally, the uh, People's Republic of China. The message is simple. Can the Chinese contact the Khmer Rouge? The Chinese in Washington refused to accept the communication. On the morning of May 13th, the CIA confirms Mayaguez is at anchor off Koh Tang. U.S. aircraft observed Cambodian boats making trips between the ship and the island. Since none have gone to the mainland, the CIA concludes the Americans have been put under Koh Tang. What they don't know is the entire crew is being held on a fishing boat in the cove just east of the island. We establish a barrier, an air barrier, uh, between Koh Tang Island and the mainland to prevent the crew from being taken to the mainland. On the evening of May 13th, Ford assembles the third meeting of the National Security Council. The news is not good. In Thailand, a helicopter transporting Air Force security personnel for an anticipated military operation has crashed, killing all 23 Americans on board. This picture was taken moments before takeoff. The crisis has claimed its first American casualties. As Ford ponders the tragedy, an urgent message is received from a pilot flying over the Mayaguez. Several boats are leaving Koh Tang and heading in the direction of the Cambodian mainland. The radio message is patched directly to the National Security Council meeting. One of the pilots of the aircraft called in and said, I have a, I have a boat here going to the mainland. It looks like there are Caucasians on board. My orders are to stop it or sink it. What shall I do? They did everything they could to stop us, try to stop the vessel from going in to the main port. We were buzzed by American planes, and then uh, they dropped uh, tear gas in the water. They shot the gunboats that were leading us. They shot those out of the water right away. There was two that turned around and went on either side of us, and as I turned around, I could see them uh, blowing them out of the water. So there was only us left. And I actually talked to the pilot and told him not to, not to sink that uh, particular vessel, and it turned out to be one with at least part of the crew on board. U.S. planes tracked the boat to within sight of the mainland, but are forced to turn back as they approach Cambodian airspace. We ended up in the the port of Kampan San, uh, where all, many people came down uh, wearing black pajamas, they all had guns. We thought we were gonna be paraded through the streets. That was actually the low point of the whole episode for us. But to the relief of the crew, and undetected by U.S. intelligence, 
they're not taken off at Kampong Som, but moved again to the nearby island of Rong Som Lem. On the morning of May 14th, Ford calls the fourth and final meeting of the National Security Council. The CIA reports that the boat which made it to the Cambodian mainland carried only part of the crew, and they have been taken into the countryside, but no one knows where. They now believe that the crew has been separated into three groups, one on the mainland, one on Koh Tang, and one remaining aboard the Mayaguez. All three are wrong. Almost all the CIA briefings turned out to be inaccurate. Now, my problem with that was not that they were inaccurate, but what was troublesome is the assurance with which they presented it, which always was wrong. Faulty intelligence has turned the crisis into a virtual shell game. Out of options, Ford plays his final card. I ordered the Pentagon to take whatever action was required, necessary, to recapture the ship and to save the crew. But the diplomatic maneuvers at that point were secondary. Uh, we believed quite clearly that only a display of force was going to bring the Cambodians to heel. Ford sets a 24-hour deadline. If the crew is not released by the morning of May 15th, contingents of the Navy, Air Force, and Marines will conduct Operation Rescue. Just after dawn, two Marine assault forces will simultaneously seize Koh Tang and the SS Mayaguez at anchor just north of the island. Navy and Air Force aircraft will support the operation, as well as bomb selected targets on the Cambodian mainland. By the evening of the 14th, U.S. forces are massing for the assault. A Marine amphibious brigade is airlifted from Okinawa to Urukau, Thailand. As they arrive, the Marine commander assigned to assault Koh Tang, Lieutenant Colonel Randall Austin, finds that he lacks even the most basic intelligence concerning his objective. Well, there were no maps, there were no, uh, there were no aerial photos, there, were no, there was no, none of the uh, normal um, kinds of uh, basic information that you would expect about an objective area. So I offered my 35 millimeter camera. I asked to send a staff sergeant to the PX to buy some film. With that, we got aboard a uh, Cessna Twin, and we headed for the island, which was around 190 miles from Utapal. We were taking uh, photos out the window of an aircraft with a handheld camera at 4,500 feet. It's not uh, optimal in terms of gathering intelligence. I was disappointed in the detail of the photographs. I did, however, see two small beaches and with that being the only advantage I saw, I knew I would have to land helicopters on two beaches simultaneously. The beaches Davis saw are on opposite sides of the northern neck of Koh Tang. The island's rocky terrain and dense jungle make landing anywhere else virtually impossible. The Marines are told that the majority of the Americans are held on Koh Tang in a compound located directly between the two beaches. They're also told a skeleton crew is still being held aboard the Mayaguez. Uh, about midnight, they started breaking out the ammunition. And uh, that was a unique experience. One of the first things that impacts you in a situation like that, that this is the real thing, is when we started handing out grenades. What the Marines don't know is that the critical intelligence they need arrives only seconds before Captain Davis boards his helicopter. A staff sergeant walked up to me and he said, Captain, here are your aerial photos. These obviously were photos taken by a U-2 or any other sophisticated air platform. They had showed barracks. It showed, looked like AA positions, round, heavily fortified AA positions. You've seen some bunkers and trenches. Within minutes, if not seconds, one of the pilots said, saddle up, we're going in. I looked over at Gunnery Sergeant McNamara and I said, Gunny, I'm not even going to show these photos to the troops. We don't have time, but I think we're in for a world of trouble.
At 4.15 a.m. on May 15, 1975, 11 Air Force helicopters carrying the two assault forces leave Utapau, Thailand. Three choppers will drop a contingent of 1st Battalion, 4th Marines on the USS Harold E. Holt for a ship-to-ship -ship assault of the Mayaguez. The eight remaining helicopters head straight for Koh Tang. The Marines were quiet. They were obviously very tense. Um, and I, when I gave them their briefing, I tried to calm them as much as I possibly could, although, you know, I'm, I was acting myself because I was as scared as anybody else, not knowing what we were going to run into. As flight operations begin on the USS Coral Sea, U.S. intelligence picks up a radio broadcast from inside Cambodia. The Cambodians issued a statement which strongly implied that the uh, hostages would be released. But they issued that on the open radio. They did not communicate it to us through a government or through any other means that they might have had available. We had to have some definitive answer from the Cambodian government. Otherwise, I had no choice. While the speech is being translated, Khmer authorities on the island of Rong Som Lem, some 35 miles from Koh Tang, release the crew of the Mayaguez, placing them back on the fishing boat. We're being escorted by a Khmer Rouge uh, PT boat. And finally, the PT boat, they waved to us and they peeled off and we realized we were being released. Nearly three hours will pass before anyone knows the Americans have been freed. As the USS Holt steams toward the Mayaguez, lookouts spot Khmer guards on her deck armed with AK-47s. In preparation for the assault, naval aircraft drop tear gas on the Mayaguez. Seconds later, the destroyer pulls alongside and the Marines storm over the ship's rail. Moving deck to deck, the Marines take the ship without firing a shot. Mayaguez is empty. In the ship's galley, a pot of warm rice and some tea are testament to the haste in which the Cambodian guards have fled. As the fishing boat carrying the freed Americans makes its way toward the Mayaguez, the Marines approach Koh Tang. The plan for the siege is simple. The eastern zone is nearest to the Cambodian compound where the Marines still believe some of the crew is being held. With units landing on the east beach and across the island on the west beach, the Marines plan to encircle the Cambodians. Over the radio, I could hear that uh, they had identified some enemy patrol boats below us that started to shoot up. I looked down and I saw an orange glow below the helicopter. I had no idea what our altitude was or where our position was in relation to the island. But the orange glow, I knew it was uh, ground fire. Although the helicopters are well out of reach of the Cambodian fire, their approach to Koh Tang is no longer a secret. The aircraft were detected as they came up from the Thai Gulf. It was around 5.30 in the morning. Our forces were contacted and alerted to be very cautious. Let me stress that our forces, having just liberated Phnom Penh, were fresh and ready. They were experienced in fighting tactics. The sun was just starting to creep over the the horizon and it's very dramatic it's it's black and then all of a sudden there's just some faint uh, sunlight and then all of a sudden the sun comes up and everything is blazing in light coming in low across the water the first two choppers approach the western zone As they attempt to land, the tree line erupts in a barrage of automatic weapons fire. 
could see a bullet puncture the side of the helicopter. And it seemed like it was in slow motion as it would come through the skin of the helicopter. As McDaniel's platoon exits the aircraft, they become the target. Staff Sergeant Salinas uh, led the charge off of uh, the helicopter. And as he walked off onto the rocks, I could see bullets bouncing off the rocks to either side of him. Sitting on the beach, McDaniel's helicopter takes punishing hits. Having lost an engine, the pilot nurses the chopper out over the water. I see the first helicopter in the western zone going out about 500 to 600 yards out into the ocean to the north end of the island, hit down in the water, sat there for like two seconds, flipped over and sank. The helicopter carrying Gunnery Sergeant McNamara and Captain Davis then circles back and attempts to insert its Marines. I was hit with something in the face and it turned me a flip. I looked to my left and the crew chief slash gunner on the gun had been hit also. Heavy machine gun fire rakes down the length of the chopper. The chopper was badly damaged. There was hydraulic fluid. You could smell fuel. The pilot uh, decided to abort and head to mainland, back to Thailand, or but we didn't know where we were going. The welcome for the choppers on the East Beach is even worse. We were doing a high-speed ingress, which is a way you want to go in to minimize your time, expose your time. Four or five helicopters approached the island. As they arrived, they were not shooting, but we knew we were in a state of war because they had already bombed our boats. Our comrades prepared themselves and opened fire on the helicopters. I, I stood up and, and, uh, and looked out the right door to kind of assess what was happening, and as we were starting to make our approach, I could see over to the other side of the island. So I started thinking to myself, maybe this is not going along according to the plan. As we approached and started to transition from our forward flight into a sideward maneuver, we started taking rounds. And uh, Randy opened up from the left side. And Rich Vandegear also got his M16, punched it out the side window vent. Just as we started to make our turn into the beach, it started uh, to the aft ramp of the aircraft to exit when we landed. And uh, as I was about halfway through the aircraft, there was a uh, loud noise, and obviously we'd been hit. I heard an explosion, and I looked uh, out the uh, door to the left, and I could see Knife 3-1 completely engulfed in flames at that point, and the helicopter just spinning madly around. I lost control completely of the helicopter. We completed part of the turn, and, and then we impacted the water. I really don't remember anything between that loud explosion and a few moments later when I woke up or came conscious uh, in about a foot of water with the aircraft uh, just to my right, uh, burning furiously. Lieutenant Tonkin and several crew members are blown out of the aircraft by the force of the explosion. With the fire spreading, many are still trapped inside. The Marines were in quite a bit of disarray in the back trying to get out of the helicopter. I see Marines trying to push through the plexiglass windows in the side of the aircraft. I yelled at a bunch of them to follow me out from underneath the, uh, the right gun there at the doorway. I heard one of the Air Force crew chiefs to my side, and he already had his survival radio out and was calling a mayday, mayday. The pilots were still in there. And, and really, with all the shock of everything, Al Corson was still trying to fly the helicopter. I was sitting there, and the next thing I remember was Sergeant Harston coming to my side wind on the helicopter. I yelled at him to, to get out, and he literally undid himself, stepped out over the rudder pedals right into the water. There was just absolutely no front on the helicopter. Uh, the co-pilot, Rich Vandegear, is slumped over in his harnesses. When I looked at uh, Lieutenant uh, Vandegear, he was hanging in his harness. Um, he was hanging. <laughs> He was hanging in his harness, just forward, his head down, hanging over the control stick. And he was obviously 
dead. And shortly thereafter, he caught on fire. Trailing just behind, the greeting for the second helicopter into the eastern zone is every bit as fierce. A direct hit completely severs the helicopter's tail section. Two helicopters were shot down. One exploded and fell in the water. The other crashed on the beach. Once we hit the deck, people collected themselves and immediately beelined out of that helicopter and into the tree line. Lieutenant Cicery and 3rd Platoon are pinned down and cut off. Only minutes into the landing, Four of the eight helicopters are damaged or destroyed, and 14 Marine and Air Force crewmen lay dead. With one helicopter burning out in the water just to the south of us, and the carcass of what's left of our helicopter sitting there fouling the landing zone, it became apparent very quickly that no one else was gonna land in there. Now the focus of the Khmer Rouge guns shifts to the survivors in the water. From the time we exited, we were all under small arms fire and automatic weapons fire. The only option we had uh, was to try to get away from that ground fire, which meant going out. Everybody else took their helmets off, and I didn't. And I don't know why I didn't, I just didn't. And as we were backing out, I was swimming, facing the island, dog paddling backwards with these guys, the two Marines actually hanging onto my shoulders on my back. A round smacked me right between the eyes, about an inch above where the helmet comes right across and drove me back into the water. And it was the, the guys I had pulled out had now pulled me out, because they had to drag me back up from where it drove me down into the water. And it split my helmet right in two. After making repeated attempts to land, the helicopter carrying the command unit with Lieutenant Colonel Randall Austin is forced to unload nearly a mile south of the West Beach. By 10 o'clock, the Marines find themselves divided into three groups, separated by dense jungle and rugged terrain. With the command unit isolated, the leadership of the main assault force falls into the hands of two second lieutenants with no combat experience. Colonel Austin comes over the radio and wants a group of Marines to come down and link up with his position. We were not, uh, not what you would call a potent fighting force, and uh, it was uh, not the kind of uh, group that you want to be isolated with in a situation like that. He was uh, the command group, and they only had four rifles among their group. Lieutenant McDaniel selects 14 Marines and heads south to link up with Austin. All of a sudden, there were three or four hand grenades that, that went off in the middle of us. Uh, my squad leader, Lance Corporal Looney, he was immediately killed. The island protecting forces prepared themselves and opened fire with grenade launchers and rifles. The leader of the American troops was wounded. There was another Marine that was directly in front of me, and then there was another Marine that was directly behind me. Uh, both those two Marines were very severely wounded. We have much ammunition and strength, and we attack the Americans fiercely. We stop attempting to fire back at them, because every time we do, there's this thick counter fire from them. So things are quiet for a second. And our folks, some of our folks, are very upset to the point of, of being hysterical. And some of them start crying out for God, for Jesus to come and help them. It was, it was a very intense moment. And the enemy were all around us. And they could hear us. They couldn't understand English but they could understand the emotion that was being expressed in our voices. And they started laughing. And it was a very eerie feeling because they were taking pleasure in hearing the, the emotion in our voices. As members of McDaniel's platoon are fighting for their lives, across the island, search and rescue helicopters are attempting recovery of the Marines on the East Beach. All of a sudden, this helicopter shows up. When they came in, it was really a, a big surprise. They got down on the deck, and when they did, even as they were coming in, it was like the 4th of July. Engulfed in flames, the helicopter is forced to abort the rescue attempt. In the water below, 
The survivors of Major Corson's helicopter had been swimming for more than three hours. I thought the helicopters were going to come back around and, uh, and pick us up right quick. But apparently, uh, when they saw us go down, they didn't think there'd be any survivors out of the crash. So they didn't even make an attempt. After three hours or so, we were getting tired and tired and, and uh, just using whatever energy we could to keep trying to move away from the island. Time started to tick by. And then I realized that I had these hand grenades in my, uh, in my pockets. And I started to, I, I couldn't fire back with my rifle, but I could at least throw these hand grenades back at them. The volley of grenades momentarily silences the Cambodian gunners, and Lieutenant McDaniel makes his withdrawal. The Marines work their way out of the killing zone and back to their lines. At that point, we realized that it probably wasn't feasible for them to, to push the perimeter very much farther to, uh, to us, and that we had to, in fact, move towards them. Nearly four hours after the crash of the helicopters on the East Beach, the survivors, many wounded and severely burned, are pulled out of the water and taken to the USS Wilson. The second wave, including Captain Davis, who would be making his second attempt to land on Koh Tang, takes off just before 10 a.m. While en route, the Marines get a message that triggers mixed emotions. At 11.55 a.m., the fishing boat released by the Khmer Rouge on the island of Rong Som Lem approaches the USS Wilson, waving a white flag. The Wilson trained his gun on us, and uh, we realized that perhaps we could be uh, shot. So uh, we waved our arms, took our shirts off, and kind of made it known that we were Americans. We got alongside, and we climbed aboard, and uh, I met a naval officer who informed me that uh, there was a few Marines that had been shot, and they were down in the, uh, on ice, as they put it, down on the Wilson. The crew of the Mayaguez, 40 Americans thought to be held on Koh Tang, are safe. In Washington, the president and his chief advisors breathe a sigh of relief. Well, after three or four days of very tense circumstances, I felt very relieved. And so our attention turned, how do we get the Marines off Koh Tang Island? And that turned into, that turned into a very difficult, very difficult operation. We're not going to plant a flag here and uh, like at Iwo Jima and, and claim it for the United States. That really wasn't the reason for us being there. If the crew's been picked up, now the next step becomes how are we going to get ourselves extracted out of this uh, out of this situation. The Marines on Koh Tang are still encountering heavy resistance, and Lieutenant Cicero's 3rd Platoon is isolated and extremely vulnerable. Without reinforcements, the Marines run the risk of becoming prisoners of the Khmer Rouge themselves. Having linked up with the main force, Colonel Austin inquires on the status of the second wave. Several times I was communicating with the Airborne uh, Command and Control Center, and asking what was the status of the second wave. And, and in one of those later inquiries, I was told, well, they've been turned back. And I, I uh, was somewhat uh, dismayed by that response and, uh, and asked that, uh, that that be reconsidered and that that second wave uh, uh, be sent to the island. Austin's message makes its point. The second wave is clear to go, but there's still more than an hour from Koh Tang. In a scene eerily reminiscent of the morning raid, the first helicopter of the second wave approaches the eastern landing zone. You don't have to be Daniel Boone to hit a helicopter, especially a 53, and they waited for the opportune time to put the maximum damage on those helicopters and on anybody that, was, that happened to be inside. The severely damaged helicopter and her much needed reinforcements heads directly for the Thai coast. The remaining choppers in the second wave unload Captain Davis and 100 Marines into the western zone. Even with the reinforcements, poor communications and heavy resistance make it impossible for the Marines to link up with Lieutenant Cicero. The only option is to get 3rd Platoon out. Circling just off the beach, search and rescue helicopters make one last attempt to extract 3rd Platoon. 
we decided it was time, uh, time to make a move. Uh, my pilot, Don Backlund, uh, he said, I think this is going to be the, uh, the last train out of Dodge City. At 5.50 p.m., Lieutenant Cicery sees the helicopter coming in for the extraction. You know, if I can see the helicopter coming in, so can, so can the bad guys. And so I knew we were going to be in for an interesting few moments when the helicopter came in. About 200 meters south, and they opened up. I could, I could just hear the bullets hit the front helicopter. With Navy and Air Force planes providing cover, 3rd Platoon fights its way off the beach and into the waiting chopper. He is hovering that helicopter, and the helicopter would, would drop down, get within about five feet of the deck, and then it would go up. So you, what we ended up having to do as people were getting aboard was time their jump, if you will, to get onto the, uh, to get onto the ramp and, and get aboard the helicopter. 12 hours after the Marines landed on Koh Tang, the rescue helicopter carrying 3rd Platoon takes off from the East Beach. During the evacuation, the chopper sustained so much damage that it would be unable to fly again. Uh, I just knew that, that we had to get those people out, that, that if we didn't do it, I didn't think it would be done. I, there's just no way to describe, I don't think, um, how elated that you are, that you realize that uh, you survived something uh, that very easily could have gone the other way, especially when I think you saw people in a similar situation who unfortunately were not as lucky as you were. With nightfall quickly approaching, the Airborne Command and Control puts the question to the Marines on the beach. Can the evacuation be done under cover of darkness? My response to that was, yes, I think we can do it under darkness, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay down one proviso here, and that is that once we start, we must have the commitment to finish this. Colonel Austin came up to me and he said, Jim, how do we want to pull this off? I said, the best thing for me to do is get this down to one commander. As the company commander, he would be left eventually with a small force and that he was going to, was going to close the beach and be amongst the last ones out. As you incrementally reduce a perimeter, especially under fire, in the dust, you run the risk of losing people and also losing the element of security. As the helicopters attempt to coordinate the withdrawal, they receive a message that a wounded Marine may have been left in one of the downed helos on the East Beach. Okay, uh, down under, stand by. We're gonna go in now with Jolly Green, one shooting at the last man. Hey, watch that. That's Black Bob, a one of the helos taking fire this time. Six, eight, five, and two, six, eight, both uh, Jolly Green's going out. Down under, this is Jolly Green, one, two, how do you read? One, two, down under, roger. Damage to Jolly Green 12 leaves only three helicopters to evacuate more than 200 Marines still on Koh Tang. Reports we were getting when we were making our run-in was that the Marines were being pushed back from the, the, the tree line to the beach to the water even, and uh, it's going to be real tight getting in there, and this isn't going to be easy. As the sun sets over the Gulf of Thailand, the evacuation of the Marines goes into full swing. To cover the evacuation, the Air Force drops the largest non-nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal, a 15,000-pound bomb on the center of the island behind the enemy positions. The explosion rocks the island to its core. We could see the parachute deploy. We could see the pallet that was below it. But I do remember making the comment, Gunny, I think they're going to give us resupplies, but it's going to the Khmer Rouge within seconds. The jungle seemed to explode, and we figured out what it was. Shortly before 7 p.m., the evac choppers approached Koh Tang. When the helicopters are making their run in, you can 
hear how bad they're getting beat sometimes. Uh, and here we're taking ground fire, taking ground fire and stuff like that. And, uh, you sit back and take a deep breath and wait your turn. Departure of each load of Marines, the forces still on the ground become more vulnerable. As the perimeter was incrementally reduced and Echo Company passed through my lines, I did ask the company commander. I said, Mike, do you have all your people? He said, yes. I said, get on the choppers. I went in out on the lines checking to make sure all my people got back. And went on to the across the open space to the south side of the western zone there and was checking echo company if any of echo company's marines were over there making sure everybody had pulled back correctly every time the perimeter is reduced khmer rouge forces fill in the gaps pushing the marines closer to the sea we'd hear the underbrush slowly crumble as the enemy very slowly crawled forward trying to come as close to our position as possible. It was a Khmer Rouge took a shot at me and they went past my flat jacket. And I dropped him with two shots. The second one turned and I got him. He fell down into the gully. That's the last I seen of him. Yeah, I've got a Jolly Green 4-4 coming in right now. Okay, hold on, rush after that. How many people are you gonna have left? I just don't know, there's still a guy around. I don't know who's going and who's there. I'm gonna just have to do the best I can. All I know is the bird is there. With the last 29 Marines clinging to a sliver of beach, Captain Davis faces the most harrowing moments of the operation. At the last perimeter, our boots were literally almost in the water. As the choppers make their way back to Koh Tang, radio contact is lost with the Marines on the beach. Bingo Shoe 06, Bingo Shoe 06, this is down under, how do you read? We're trying to figure out, wait a second, do they know we're still here? Or, uh, how are we going to get off? Any Marines up this spring answer that are on the beach? That's probably the longest time of my life. When your boots are wet, and the elbows are in beach sand, there's not a lot, you don't own a lot of real estate. And there are not a lot of alternatives at that point in time, except fighting to the death or swimming. Shortly after 8 p.m. on May 15, 1975, 15 hours after the first Marines had fought their way onto Koh Tang, the final helicopter touches down on the beach. We boarded the helicopter, and then I remember Tech Sergeant Fisk jumping out of the helicopter one more time with the ramp down and checking, making a hasty check of the right side. And then as he got back on the ramp of the chopper, the chopper took off. Fisk slips. The only thing I could grab was his cord to his microphone on his helmet. His eyes were getting bigger and bigger as he was sliding out of the back of that helicopter. Then I reached down and got his sleeve or his arm, I grabbed something and yanked him up. It threw his body into my lap and we gave each other a big hug and that was it. The day was over. We gathered the bodies of the American soldiers and put them all together. We determined that we had taken back the island and achieved victory. Minutes later, word reaches the White House. The Marines have been evacuated from Koh Tang. But for the Marines, the relief is short-lived. Just within minutes of the, of the extraction, uh, we're taking a head count and making sure, um, trying to determine who we have, uh, certainly 
expecting that we're going to have everybody. Colonel Austin walked up to me and he said, Jim, to the best of your knowledge, did you get all the Marines off that beach? And I said, yes, sir. Echo Company had three Marines missing. Lance Corporal Joseph Hargrove, Private First Class Gary Hall, and Private Danny Marshall were last seen shortly before the final load of Marines withdrew from Kotang. It seems that if they would have been alive, they would have come back and joined us, number one. Number two, why didn't they call out for help? We, I think, came to the correct and the only logical decision that, that these three Marines had been killed in the uh, extensive um, exchange of fire that occurred uh, as the helicopters came in for the extraction. The final report concludes that Hall, Hargrove, and Marshall were killed in action. Two to three days later, several American soldiers came out of the force. We did not know where they came from. They came out because they did not have water to drink. The water around the island is salt water. Therefore, they need to come out and get drinking water. The island's protecting forces caught them and question them, then they were sent to headquarters. It is the worst scenario that goes through my mind every day. It's uh, bad enough that I, I left the island and had Marines that were KI, I left Marine bodies back here, which I don't like doing. Uh, to think that if those Marines were alive, and I would have went back in myself. If there were Marines on that island, that there was any question as to whether or not they would have been dead or alive, we would have had to die there. And we know that. Including the crash of the Air Force helicopter in Thailand, the cost of the Mayaguez operation was high. 41 U.S. military personnel were killed and 50 more were wounded. The fact that the bodies of some U.S. servicemen were never recovered from the island left doubts and open wounds for years to come. Even worse was the revelation that the heavy resistance the Marines encountered on Kotan had nothing to do with the United States or the seizure of the Mayaguez. The Cambodians and, and the Vietnamese were having a confrontation about who owned Koh Tang Island. And the Cambodians had put troops on the island to assert their sovereignty. We didn't know that. As the American ship Mayaguez comes along, the Khmer Rouge run out and seize it, fearful that it's somehow some part of some possible Vietnamese or American trick to begin to retake the country. Tragically, the Mayaguez crisis erupted in the wrong place at the wrong time. Was it in fact necessary? We, we don't know. We spotted important national interests at stake and we moved very quickly and in an ad hoc kind of way to protect those national interests and it worked. It was only the question of force that led the Cambodians to deliver uh, up the hostages. The only answer was the one that we took, meet it head on. And we achieved what we set out to do. But when you looked at it in the bigger scheme of things, uh, it was sort of a paltry objective. Uh, we had entered Indochina to save countries. And we wound up rescuing a ship. Back on Koh Tang, the reality of what the Marines faced in 1975 can still be seen. Fragments of American helicopters, overgrown bunkers, and trees scarred with bullet holes are haunting reminders of the horrors of war. From fortified positions in the dense tree line, Khmer Rouge forces laid in wait to greet the Marines with a force at least five times the original estimates. We may never know the truth about the missing Americans, 
Were they killed in action as the official report states? Or are they part of the dark secrets buried in the killing fields of Cambodia? In the end, the Mayaguez crisis is four days that are a mere footnote in the controversial history of U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia. In the end, a list of names lost amidst all of the bad news that was the Vietnam War.